Let me move now to to our next speaker, uh, Dilip Dilip Ratha, who is the um, from uh, the uh, uh, World Bank's specialist on migration and and remittances, and many of us have heard Dilip speak very often, and he has been with us also in many of these journeys. And Dilip, I know you have made a strong case for remittances. And you have also been part of this call that has been launched by the Swiss and UK governments. The World Bank is part of that to say, keep the remittances flowing. The question is, if workers should have remittances, have salaries, have wages to keep the remittances flowing. If they don't have that, how can they flow? The other point is, I, and I'm wondering if the World Bank, because of this data that you bring out, and it's huge, and I, I know you'll give us some of these figures of what this drop means. But uh, the 20% drop, which is the general kind of indicator now, is even much bigger when you look at individual countries. For example, countries like Nepal, where it's much bigger than 20% kind of thing in terms of drops. I'm wondering if the World Bank in bringing out these remittances and you pose it from a development perspective, a poverty reduction perspective and things like that, can you give us disaggregated data? How much money is lost or how much remittances is lost because of wage theft in any given year. Is it possible for you to give us that kind of data to make it, to, you know, for us, for us to hit, for it to hit home that justice is also an entitlement, like Sh Sir Shahid has said. So is that possible in, in how you all collect this data on remittances? Dilip. Thank you, William. Uh, it's amazing to see the, the panel, the participants, and it's also, um, really nice to see a number of friends I had not seen, uh, at least on screen. Um, and it would have been wonderful to do that in person, but of course we cannot do uh, that. Um, the uh, question you posed to how much of the um, remittance decline, decline in remittances is due to wage theft. Um, if you pose the question that way, I would say that the entire 20% decline that we, we are looking into, looking at for 2020 is uh, quite likely because of uh, uh, either um, migrants are uh, uh, facing unemployment or would, will face unemployment or because their wages are falling. And, uh, uh, some of the fall in wages would be because of, um, uh, you know, uh, renegotiation or uh, recontracting by the employer saying, okay, my business is suffering, so I cannot pay you as much. Uh, so take a pay cut. Or uh, the other part is um, the employer simply doesn't pay and uh, runs away with the money. So, um, there is uh, definitely an element of uh, wage theft, a significant part of remittance decline uh, is because of the because of uh, wage theft. And um, uh, I'm glad that you are looking at the, the, the justice angle uh, in this whole thing, because uh, the money is rightly uh, of the migrant, it belongs to the migrant. And uh, because migrants don't have a voice and access to quick justice. And often if uh, the migrant raises his or her voice, then uh, the person is deported quickly, often with the help of the judicial system. Um, the voice is never heard and employers know that. So they take advantage of it. So to put things in perspective, um, Last year, remittances sent by migrant workers to low and middle income countries were $554 billion. That was only recorded remittances. And uh, uh, unrecorded remittances through Hawala or through hand carry um, is additional. At that recorded level, 2019 marked a milestone in the sense that uh, for the first time, remittances overtook also foreign direct investment flowing through all the multinational companies of this world to low and middle income countries. That's a remarkable um, fact. Um, remittances sent by 
poor migrant workers in small little transactions like $200 or $50, they add up to a larger amount than all the money flowing through all the multinational companies in the world. Uh, that is a remarkable fact. This year, because of the crisis, the lockdown of businesses, businesses closing, uh, not being able to operate because of uh, social distancing and travel bans, which have got people uh, stranded in wherever they are. Um, we are expecting that uh, uh, remittances would fall by 20%. So that would be about $109 billion. And in countries like Nepal, where remittances are already one third of the national income, the fall would be larger. Indeed, the fall would be larger in fra fragile and conflict affected countries like Haiti or Afghanistan, Somalia, South Sudan, uh, the, the fall would be even, even larger. Um, so a large number of families back home that had escaped poverty, uh, they were at the borderlines of the poverty or below the poverty line and they had escaped poverty because of remittances coming in on a sustainable basis month after month and even more so in, in times of difficulty, there is a risk now that many of them would fall back into poverty. And then there is the uh, problem with food insecurity uh, that can affect in countries that are already vulnerable to food security issues. For example, East African countries or Zimbabwe, where there are already, uh, there were already worries about locust, for example, in, in East Africa. And this problem will compound that. So some problems that we had not thought about for a long time, like food insecurity, malnutrition, uh, they would probably come back with the fall in remittances. So what you are seeing now is the crisis causing more of wage theft and unemployment and wage losses and that translating into lower remittances, which would then translate into lots of hardships at very individual level. Um, we knew that remittance recipient families in Sri Lanka or in Mexico had children with higher birth weight. Maternal health was better in families that receive remittances. All that would be unraveled now. So it's a serious humanitarian difficulty. And coming back to the question of uh, what to do about wage theft or what to do with stranded migrants now, a few things, and then I'll talk about a couple of ideas that have been proposed in this conversation. First, uh, migrants are stranded and they are stranded because migrants tend to go to mostly urban economic centers they are stranded in urban economic centers. And if migrants are not healthy, no one is healthy given the current crisis, current pandemic. So there is an urgent need to take care of stranded migrant workers and all migrant workers, especially those in dormitories and labor uh, sort of camps, not only to help these people who are in millions, but also to help the native population, the citizens themselves in the host communities. So that's the first point. So social protection measures, cash transfers, healthcare provision, provision to housing, access to healthcare and hygiene, running water. These are, uh, the, the, there is a need for those measures to be inclusive of migrant workers. Even if they're not their own people, they are there and Host countries, host communities need to take care of the migrant workers just for their own sake. So that's the number one uh, need, policy recommendation, policy suggestion. Second one relating to remittances is to recognize remittances as essential services and then try to keep remittances flowing because every dollar spent through remittances or to benefit migrant workers would translate into helping many, many more people, four, five, six, 10 people back home in other communities, back home in the origin countries. 
So th the same dollar spent by a host community government will translate into benefiting so many more people out there. So there is a very strong reason to do that, to be inclusive of migrants. And of course, not to forget that origin countries also do not always take care of families of migrants because they fall off the, the, the books, so to say. They fall through the cracks. So there is that need. There is a talk about increasing uh, online remittance transactions, uh, like you know everything online is, is taking place now. The problem with online remittance transactions is that they require financial inclusion. Uh, they require access to bank accounts and credit cards. And the, the laws in most communities, both actually origin countries as well as host countries, uh, do not allow opening of bank accounts either by the migrants or sometimes, actually oftentimes, uh, for the money transfer companies themselves. So these are sort of some recommendations that come right away. Now talking about waste theft and some ideas that have been proposed. First to point out, it's not only the waste theft, it is the whole social security package that is stolen. It was being stolen all along. We know that uh, the taxes paid by migrants into social security systems, the, the contributions to social security system, pensions, healthcare, those things do not accrue to the migrants until they retire, unless they retire in the destination country. So it's a systematic way of stealing migrants' money. And uh, that has become even more important in the, in the current context when every penny that the migrant can bring home would, would be so much more important now. So there is that overall you know, overarching issue. And um, uh, in that context, the justice system that you are proposing of uh, registering the cases, uh, perhaps even rating employers, having a track record of you know, employers. Okay, here is like, you know, people do that, you know, they trade value chain, global value chain for let's say textile uh, or carpet trade. There are companies which are being rated on uh, according to whether they are working with suppliers who hire child labor or who do uh, abuses of workers. Why can't we do the same about construction companies and about all the good companies out there? So there is that uh, need as well. And then the final point about uh, starting a fund and international collaboration. These two are related issues. See the international uh, institutions, they all have their mandate. There is only probably only one institution out there which is really the only mandate is to look at migration. But that organization does everything for which it gets money. And then the other organizations, they look at migration only as the third item or the 30th item or the 300th item. They all have their mandate. So first of all, we need an organization whose mission is very, very clear about what it does about migration. There isn't one right now. If there is an organization, it does not have a mission or it has a mission that is completely confounded and it does not stick to the mission. So there is that need. And related to that is the whole issue of you cannot be independent and do something unless you have money. So you need the political mandate, but you also need the money. That is where the need for funds comes in. And nobody has put together, together the data on how much money the world spends in my, managing migration. And uh, some part of it will be about managing recruitment process, recruitment costs, recruitment malpractices. But managing migration, I think, probably several hundred billion dollars are spent every year, every year, not cumulatively, every year by rich countries and poor countries too. If a certain part of that were allocated to a fund and create a migration financing facility, migration facility or financing facility, it would be a concessional financing facility to address many issues, but in particular, the most important issue is that if there is a host community or a host country government, it just does not have the framework to use taxpayers' money to spend on foreigners. It just does not have a framework. 
migration has that global public good element and those host countries including for example you know that what happened in the case of let's say syrian refugees in lebanon or jordan a concessional financing facility was created so that host countries could actually take care of foreign born people now there is a move on the part of many rich country governments to change aid the definition of aid and count what is spent by them to take care of refugees including agents that that address refugee issues their costs to include those costs and count them as aid so the aid number we see official aid number actually the true aid if you look at time series 5 years ago or 10 years ago they are not comparable the migration financing facility therefore is needed as a global public good to support global public efforts to address migration issues including waste theft because there is the global public good element here and finally awareness raising like the work you do uh, and is ra- raising awareness on the part of businesses on the part of civil society on the part of governments members of parliament all over the world and finally educating migrants educating migrants about their rights and enabling them is what is really needed in the end migrants have to fend for themselves as they have always done and that is where the most of the bang for the buck would come so let me stop there thank you thank you thank you dilip you surely have uh, raised a lot of provocative thoughts and have given a lot of ideas really like the whole idea of if we and this might be an idea for us when we think of building back better is how can social protection be part of the new contracts that are there because this is the missing element for sure and this might be something to put in definitely in the new contracts and in the new uh, kind of governance that we are looking at uh, i also like very much the the and how you have brought in the campaign it's not only wage that is stolen but the whole social security package that is stolen and i think this is this is uh, the insight definitely that we we uh, we are looking at as well uh i the, the idea of a migration facility this is the fund facility and i'm i've seen my colleagues like mayan on this call and i'm sure they will they will reflect about this in the in the days to come and it is true i think it, it there has to be something like this the, and you have rightly pointed out the limitations of the institutions that we have and it's not all uh, in dealing with migration they uh, and then even if they come together in any conglomerate uh, in kind of collective whether it's the gmg which used to exist or whether it is the un network now they don't seem to have that capacity to address issues like this and so we might want we might want to look at this and that's why i like this uh, and i like the idea also that if we calculate how much is spent on governance and managing migration kind of thing if a small portion a fraction of that could be put aside for this kind of a financial facility that you are talking about that will be fantastic but i was wondering and i'll come back to you on this uh, with a question is to say you've said rating of employers i know there ha- there are several kind of programs and applications now among trade unions the itc has one in collaboration with mfa of this rating of uh, of employers and recruiters and things like that but i want to come back to you on this question that i asked you would uh, is it possible in this remittances data then to be actually showing just like how you have a rating can we show in which corridors migration corridors there is this big issue of wage theft like you know is it possible to bring out data like this to bring to hold states because only if the world bank does something like this and has the capacity to do something like this in terms of make that data talk break it down in a way that it talks to the ordinary man you know because remittances billions and numbers and things like that we get lost in that even in the calculation how do they calculate but when you talk about it in terms of wage theft and you break it down to the ordinary man then you realize what is at stake here so is that possible for the world bank to actually do something like that in in the data that you all put out uh, y- y- yes it is possible um, it would be controversial but if we uh, go through you know world bank is a cooperative of uh, you know 190 odd uh, governments and uh, uh, you know we could put a proposal of this kind 
to them and if they say it's okay we can go ahead with it without that it would be difficult but that that means is um, migration brings the complexity of uh, you know having uh, host country government and the origin country government actually in plural so host country governments and origin country governments and indeed every country is both a host country as well as a origin country so it brings that complexity of multilateralism right away and uh, uh, there is a reluctance on the part of major governments to um, bring migration into a multilateral kind of forum and world bank is one right so with that caveat purely uh, highlighting the issue of wage theft i don't think anybody would be saying that that should be avoided because there is also as as with ilo with richard and um with uh, michel leighton and all we are working on with nomad uh, on the sustainable development goal to reduce recruitment costs paid by workers and that is that is a sustainable development goal indicator 10.7.1 uh, right and as part of that we are doing surveys of um, uh, how much individual uh, migrant workers are paying for uh, uh, for getting the uh, to, to be able to get the visa you know the recruitment cost indicator itself and we also need data for that we are collecting data on how much that cost uh, is compared to the wages they would earn abroad right i think we can add questions on elements of wage theft but uh, there it, there are difficulties because um, migrants in the host communities don't talk they don't want to talk about these issues because they are afraid uh, we had that experience in spain our first pilot on this that nomad did um, we had to go through employers and of course then nobody wants to talk right um, that problem is there so now we are interviewing return migrants and re- using the recollection they can tell us uh, a little bit about what was lost what was gained um your idea of talking to the migrant workers and and, and registering their grievances at the time of repatriation or immediately after that quite likely if you do that uh, when they are in the plane uh, if you are able to identify them because there is a bit of time there i think it can be done it can be done and even if we are able to do that for a thousand people to start with that would be a wealth of uh, knowledge so long answer to to say that uh, your proposal is is good it can be done um, and we will we'll look into that thanks thanks dilip and just to say we ourselves are trying to build the evidence for it we have asked countries of destination to do it at the repatriation time but we are also suggesting they do it at the quarantine time the 14 days in quarantine is another moment so we are putting the data together on this and we happy to share it with you as soon as we've got something going that is substantive but